All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining me today. I have an incredible guest. I have the world-renowned Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, Neil, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Well, thanks for having me, and thanks for your interest. So uh, just for people that maybe don't know you, I'm sure many people do. You have a, a very famous face now. <laughs> uh, you are an astrophysicist. You are an author and an incredible communicator. Uh, in the realm of science and other things. Uh, you're also probably best known to a lot of people for the uh, show Cosmos, uh, A Space-Time Odyssey. Uh, and we talked a little bit about that before uh, hitting hitting record. What a great show. You, you had pointed out that uh, you guys later learned that it was something that brought multiple generations together where they could sit on the couch and and watch that together. I'm, I'm sure that warmed your heart uh what are your thoughts on that well there's two of them there was 2014 which was cosmos a uh, space-time odyssey and then 2020 uh cosmos possible worlds which was a little more um uh, it was uh, more sort of directed towards what are we doing to the world today and what maybe we should be doing if we're going to assure the survival of our species and the survival of life on this planet and uh, what we learned was that the the style of the program, uh, it aired in in prime time, like at nine o'clock, right? Late late prime time, it aired in late prime time, and they so if you have a like a seven year old kid, eight year old kid, who can't get to sleep, you put him to bed at eight, and they still get, and they come out, and then they see what you're watching, and then they curl up on the couch with you. You're not going to send them back to bed. Because Cosmos is on. <laughs> so you leave them there and everybody then, uh, everybody participates. So we learned that Cosmos was in modern days practically unique in the fact that more than one generation could sit on a couch and watch it and then embrace it and still uh, claim sort of ownership of what you gleaned from it. And there aren't many shows or any kind of entertainment at all that crosses generations like that. So we were very, very pleased to learn that about it. Yeah, that's great. My son and I, my four, well, he's 14 now, but uh, this was a few years ago. Uh, we enjoyed watching that. And it's probably time for me to go through it with my daughters now that they're old enough. But, um, you know, you mentioned uh, your series on, you know, other planets. Uh, Elon Musk, another well-known figure, is obsessed with the idea of getting humans off planet Earth and over to Mars. Uh, I'm certain many great advancements and technologies will be created or at least refined to do that. But I, I wonder sometimes, is it worth all the time and effort and money to go to Mars? Or would that money be better spent on Earth, our already amazing and habitable home planet? Okay, well, there are a couple of sides to that. So let me... Let me go to the more blunt uh, dimension of that question, which is, are, will we get to Mars at all, no matter what? And this notion, let's go to Mars because we've been to the moon, completely sidesteps the reason why we went to the moon. Right? It sounds like, oh, it was the natural next step. With We're explorers. It's in our DNA. We're Americans. It's not why we went to the moon. We went to the moon to beat the Russians to the moon that's why we went to the moon and why does that matter because that's what enabled congress to write the checks for that to happen even in kennedy's speech that he delivered to a joint session of congress in may 1962 just six weeks after yuri gagarin had been the first human to orbit earth and here we are without a spacecraft that wouldn't blow up trying to make it capable of carrying people wouldn't blow up on the launch pad. We were, we were well behind in that race. If we call it that the space race, As president Kennedy says, in addition to the sentence, let's put a man on the moon and return him safely to earth, which by the way is chiseled in the granite wall of Kennedy space center behind the bust of JFK. Plenty of, other room on that wall to put other parts of that speech, but they left it out. Another part of the speech says, if we are to, if the events of recent weeks couldn't even utter the man's name, 
Yuri Gagarin. If the events of recent weeks are any indication of the impact, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but this is the gist of it. Are any, if the events of recent weeks are are any indication of the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere, then we need to show the world the path of freedom over the path of tyranny. It was a battle cry against the godless co communists. That's what wrote the checks. Not, oh, let's go to the moon because that would be kind of cool. The 60s was a turbulent decade. Yeah. The most turbulent decade on American soil since 100 years before when we had the Civil War with uh, unrest on campus unrest by the way when we first went to the moon it was 1968 in that year it was our bloodiest year in vietnam and we had two assassinations on domestic soil and like i said there was campus unrest and urban riots but we went to the moon so if there were ever a time you would say we have problems on earth let's fix those before we go into space it would have been then not today Yet we went to the moon because it was a geopolitical force far greater than any urge to explore could have ever um, manifested. So that's my first reaction to your comment. Yes. Second reaction is, all right, uh, what you sound like is, let's invent a conversation from 30,000 years ago, and we're in the cave, and uh, there's some young whippersnappers who want to who peeked out the cave door and saw like mountains and valleys and hills and, and rivers and streams and fruit on trees. They wouldn't have a word for fruit because they've never been outside the cave yet. So they go to the cave elders. These are the 30 year olds. <laughs> <Back then. laughs> if you're a cave elder, maybe you're 35. Some folks live longer than that, but half of anyone born was dead by the age of 35. Just something to remember. Uh, and and by the way, all their food was organic, and their river, <laughs> their water was clear, and the air was clean. Just you know, sometimes science matters here in the equation. So you go to the elders, and they caucus, and they say, "No, you, we won't let you leave the cave until we solve the cave problems first. That's what you sound like when you say, "Why are we going to Mars when we have problems on Earth?" Wouldn't the money, money be better spent? Then you have to ask, how much money is that? How much is it? Let's look at NASA's budget relative to the federal budget. It is four-tenths of 1% of the federal budget. That means 99.6% of all tax money goes to other things. And you're going to focus on that 4.4% and say, you're misspending your money here. Put it on something else to fix it. Really? Really? That's what you want to do with that 0.4%? And you're not going to like pay attention to the rest of the 99.6? There's a mismatch of priorities there. And we're a wealthy country. Maybe we could do it all. Whatever the other thing is you think that money should be going to. And my last point is, almost to a person who feels that way, you say, well, how much money do you think we're spending on space? And they come up with 10%, 15%. And then you tell them it's 0.4, it's four tenths of a penny on a tax dollar. They're surprised. And so I wanted to start a movement where all federal agencies, that where their budget equaled what people thought they were getting. <laughs> if that were the case, NASA's budget would be 10 times what it is today. So now we talk about private enterprise. Well, private enterprise spend money on whatever the hell they want because it's private enterprise. All right. If they want to try to make a buck, space tourism, um, Elon is selling his launch services to people who want satellites in orbit. It's an entire business. In fact, the space business all told, not just government spending, but but uh, um, all spending combined worldwide is a half a trillion dollars. So that's a lot of money, but most of that is in business interest. Dish TV among them, for example. So, yeah. And, and that does not include the businesses that are run using space assets, like Uber. Uber does not exist without GPS satellites. 
I did not include the value of Uber in that number. So, yeah. There, there's been a lot of inventions that came from us going to space, right? Like, self, I, Yeah, self, but self I don't even care about those. And... Yes, yes. But that's not the big, that's not the takeaway here. That Yeah, we could list that. But there are plenty of inventions that came without going to space. That's not the point. If you have a business model and you want to have sell seats for tourists, that's the reason to go into space. That's why you're going into space. If you want to go into space because of the geopolitical reason, why are we returning to the moon now instead of 10 years ago or 10 years before that or 10 years before that or 10 years before that or 10 years before that? Oh, well, it feels like it's the right time. Okay. Let's part the curtains. China says they're going back to the moon, going to the moon for the first time. There's a geopolitical driver. China has been a frenemy of ours of recent years, right? What do you do with a frenemy? We're trading partners, but we're a little bit spooked, um, you know, this sort of thing. And so we're going back to the moon. And no one is mentioning that we're spooked by China in doing it. I mean, I'm saying it right now, but no one else is mentioning it in the official literature of the of these this urge to return to the moon in the Artemis program. Okay, interesting. Thank you for that. Um, help help me understand this. I I took astronomy in college, but I I was foolish. I signed up for the six a.m. class. Um, but um, so we we have the Big Bang, right? Thirteen to fifteen billion years ago. Uh, Thirteen point eight. You might have been taught 13 to 15, but we've tightened that up since then. Okay. I don't know how old you are, but we tightened it up since then. Yeah, uh, I'm in my 40s, so okay. I'm still saying 15 at the time. So 13.8, uh, you know, we're now dealing with light and dust and gas that are being spewed out of this location. Uh, over time, they condense and heat and cool and create different elements and minerals and building blocks and gases and liquids. We now are starting to get the periodic table. Um, what, what did, what does it mean when we say we're, we're looking back, you know, 13.8 billion into the past Are are we saying we're actually seeing the light from there still, or is it yes. the light that came yes. and it's just now reaching our eyes? Yes. 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 To all of the above. Okay. That's the light I'm was thinking. emitted 13.8 billion years ago, and it is only now just reaching our eyes. Okay. Correct. Now, a way to think about it is, uh, so this is not the physical reality, but it will help in understanding the physical reality. Just imagine the universe is this, it's just, it's infinite. Just imagine it's infinite, okay? And you have galaxies scattered everywhere. Okay. Um. Well, this universe was born 13.8 billion years ago. So galaxies are being born. Universe is born. So galaxies are born shortly after that. Now watch. As I look farther away from our galaxy, I see galaxies not as they are, but as they once were. Okay? Because it takes light time to reach us. So if I find a galaxy 5 billion light years away, its light has been traveling for 5 billion years. Okay? If I find a galaxy 13 whose light has been traveling for 13 billion years, that light came from that galaxy while it was being born. So as I look out, the universe looks younger and younger to me. And I reach a point where I actually see the remnants of the Big Bang itself. Can I see beyond that? No, the universe isn't old enough. There's a galaxy sitting beyond that. But that's... 15 billion light years away or 20 billion light years away we the universe has not been alive long enough for its light to reach us now keep keep with this analogy okay let's wait five billion years so that horizon viewing horizon is now another six billion years wider and so now that galaxy that was sitting 20 billion light years away which we couldn't see if the universe is now 20 billion years old, now we watch that galaxy being born. And look a little beyond that, and we see the Big Bang for whatever materials in the universe at that time. 
So the Big Bang will always be coming to us as long as there is material universe beyond our horizon. That's hard to wrap your head around. Yeah, well, I, I said the, <laughs> the universe is under no obligation to make sense to you. Boy, is that true. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, bow down. Tell me all your secrets. That's what we really want, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, but not all of them will be understood. Yeah. So, okay. So we have like the 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 Milky Way galaxy. Our own galaxy. Uh, yeah. So when, when this material, you know, spews out, does it go in all directions like a sphere or does it does it come out like a bulging disc and we're out on the periphery of of yeah, nothing that? comes out of anything the the fabric of space expands so when we say the universe is expanding we're not talking about galaxies moving in the space of the universe we're talking about the space of the universe expanding carrying the galaxies with it so the, the balloon analogy works pretty well okay you have a balloon and you paint little galaxies on it and you inflate the balloon the balloon gets bigger and bigger the galaxies are not moving in the balloon. The balloon is expanding. Okay. That then you can ask, well, where's the center of that expansion? Well, it's nowhere on the surface of the balloon because the surface of balloon is the present. The center of that expansion occurred 13.8 billion years ago. And so you have to go backwards in time to find the center. But right now, it's long gone. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. I like, I like that because I can imagine... A dot on a balloon moving the out. Surface of a balloon, yes. The surface of the balloon. Okay, okay. Boy, this is a uh, big stuff. <laughs> mm. All right. Um, so when I was around twelve years old, my parents let me sleep out in the backyard alone under the stars. Uh, I remember looking up at all the stars, and it, it was the first time in my life where I felt small, like I was just a speck of dust in a really big galaxy. Um, but it, it made me want to understand science and, and earth and, and space. Did you have a, a, a moment like that yourself where uh, a, a switch flipped on that you were like, science is my thing, that this is, this is what I want to pursue in my career or in my life or in my, in, in, you know, just in your joy? I was nine years old, a okay. first visit to my local planetarium, because my actual sky over the Bronx, New York, does not reveal many stars eight maybe 10 on a good night so my first real sky was the hayden planetarium and i was hooked ever since the i i think the universe called me okay because i ever since then it, i've known that that's what i wanted to do but it would take a couple of years to figure out that there's a profession called astrophysics but from then onward had you and asked me that annoying question that adults always ask kids which is what <laughs> what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> well, my answer was astrophysicist from age 11 onward. Wow. Okay. Um, and didn't you go... It had nothing to do with feeling small. It had to do with, oh my gosh, there's a vast universe and there's a lot we don't know about it. I want to participate in that discovery. That's a different attitude yeah. than, gosh, I feel small. Let me go find a religion or find some bit of philosophy so that I can feel good about myself in the face of how small I am. Right? This is a forced operating on many, many people throughout history uh, through to today. Uh, as a scientist, you have to learn to love the questions themselves because the questions are what drive you. They get pull you out of bed each morning. And if you were depressed by them, you got to really take up another field. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good way to put it. Um, so um, you, you've got a new book out, um, To Infinity and Beyond. Um, it, it's, it's a beautiful book full of, uh, I mean, you guys teamed up with National Geographic. Yeah. Well, they're the publishers and, you know, they don't make ugly books. So yeah. Yeah, this book is, is, is lushly illustrated, but it's not so much a coffee table book only to just point to and just look at. It is a very readable account of our F there it is, uh, of our efforts to ascend from earth's surface and driven by questions we've asked, achieve those questions, achieve the limits of those questions, and then keep going. That's to the infinity and beyond part, right? What does it mean to go beyond infinity? Well, it actually can mean something mathematically, but that's not how we're using the term. 
We're just using it as, you know, go back a few hundred years and we're standing flat footed on Earth. If you wanted to get to the moon, how would you do that? Well, you have no idea. Well, let's start moving through the air. You'd be surprised how late in the coming hot air balloons were. All right. People had to learn and understand buoyancy and that hot air is less dense and it rises. This is the physics of fluids that had to come to be understood so that you can put your life at risk attempting it. And the very first aeronauts was a sheep, a chicken, and a duck. And I feel bad for the sheep because if something had gone wrong, the duck and the chicken, you know, have some chance of landing softly, <laughs> but not the sheep. All right. So the poor sheep. Anyhow, you go up, <clears throat> you learn that the pressure is different. There's less oxygen. All of these are steps. A lot of them are failures. You know, when Icarus plunged to his death, when his wings melted for flying too close to the sun, do you say, I'm never going to try that? Or do you say, let me make wings of a different material and then keep trying it? All right. Where, where are you on that spectrum of curiosity? So this book chronicles our efforts to take our physical bodies from Earth's surface to ascend the atmosphere, cross into space, go into orbit, go to the moon, possibly onto Mars and beyond. Now, Mars and beyond right now is the purview of our robotic emissaries. So right now, the, the farthest one of those is halfway to the nearest stars, practically. So how about beyond that? Well, we, not physically, but mentally, there's an infinity and beyond. What's beyond our galaxy? What's beyond our Big Bang? Is there a multiverse? So this book tracks that. But that's not the fun part of the book. That's there. But the fun part is, I think, the fun part, it comes from my podcast called Star Talk. And the podcast is a braid of three strands of DNA. One of them is science. Another one is pop culture. The third is humor. That's the recipe, if dare I call it that, for the every show that we make for Star Talk. And so whenever the science touches a topic about which a movie was made, I'll comment on how well the movie did it. You know, uh, how well did it wear it? <laughs> did it yeah. How, <laughs> whatever the red carpet contest is. Uh, how's it wearing this topic? Did they get it right? Did they get it wrong? Had they gotten it right, could they told a better story? So throughout the book, the scenery, if I call it that, are excursions into pop culture movies stories topics that you're already familiar with and then you see how the science of the book relates to that and again that's part of our dna for yeah. star talk yeah um when you when you watch science fiction uh it, is it hard to not see what they got wrong for example let's say like the movie contact um or star trek something like that are you just enjoying it and letting it be entertainment entertainment to you? Or does your brain go, oh, I, I don't think that could happen. They're really jumping the shark over here. H how does your mind react to science fiction? Okay, so for, you're not to explain to everyone who's 30 and under what jumping the shark means, but you'll do that on your own time. Okay, okay? <laughs> so, so uh, I'm, that's how I've been typecast. But that's not actually what I do. Okay. I focus on fundamental bits of science that were either ignored and should have been there, given the other science that the story contained, or they got wrong because they didn't understand it. And all it would have taken would call your high school physics teacher, okay? And they'll help you get that right. So then they're just being lazy. And there are people who say, well, it's just a movie, let it go. And I, I'm, I don't accept that, and I'll tell you why. Um, let's say you have a friend who's a, a car expert. No shortage of them in this world. Yeah. Loves cars, okay, especially American cars. And you go see some period piece, all right, made in modern times, but supposed to take place. Let's say it's a movie in the 1950s. Let's say 1958. And then there's a 1960 Bel Air parked on the street. Your friend will say, that car doesn't belong there. That didn't come out for another two years. You'll say, hey, you know your cars. 
you're good at this. Well, if you have a friend who's a, who's a costume designer and there's a Jane Austen period piece and a gentleman gets off his carriage as they come up to the country home and he's wearing a derby instead of a top hat and your friend says, no, derbies um, had gone out of style by then. It's the top hat that he would have been wearing. So they mess. You say, hey, you know your costume styles. These people are honored in their in these roles. And now I point out a few things that people get wrong in the science, and you're going to say, well, stay home? That's I, I don't think that's fair. I think I'm not fully understood in my motives, if that's how you're reacting to them. Yeah. So it's got to be something that, you got most of your stuff right and you happen to get something wrong or you don't care about getting anything right and you happen to get something right. I'm going to highlight both of those. And I do. I give a whole public talk called An Astrophysicist Goes to the Movies. And that was so successful. It was followed by An Astrophysicist Goes to the Movies, the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and I show, you know, dozens of movie clips and I comment on them, the science they attempted. And it's not just sci-fi. No, no. There's like animated films, there's Disney films, all kinds of films that touch on science in ways you might not know. And then I, I celebrate that. Yeah. I celebrate the fact that artists give a shit about science at all. Yeah. And, and if they're going to reach for it, I'm there for them because yeah. they don't have to. Yeah. It, it is nice, though, when they, you know, put in the research to try to get it as right as possible, you know, so, yep. for example, let's say, like, Interstellar, when they're trying to explain, you know, time, uh, black holes, um, you know, again, I, I want to say jump the shark, but, you know, okay, they, <laughs> they, they, they took it too far, right? So, um, or, um, oh, gosh, I can't think of another example, but um like the like the martian right okay how would you survive if you were left behind on mars could you use human fecal matter to grow uh organic you know material things like that when they get it completely wrong it just it, it's almost like fast and the furious 11 when they jump a car off a cliff and everyone survives and you go oh, i don't think they quite got that right um but you know, the fact that they're trying to to get the science right. Well, is that the I only one it. that worried you and not the one where they drove their car into space? <laughs> I stopped watching after Fast and the Furious 1. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, one of them, they they, they go into orbit. Yeah. Okay. In their car. Yeah. Just, oh, yeah just off the cliff and then they land safely. Yeah. Okay. So, so I, yes, there's a point where you suspend disbelief. I, I don't have a problem. That movies are all about that. That's that's why they exist and why they can be so popular and yeah. successful with viewers. Um, but in an example, what's a, what's a good example here? Uh, Star Wars, the original. I want to call it Episode One, but I'm not allowed to. Uh, episode Four, the you know Luke, I think he's on the sand planet or something, and he comes out and he sees a double sunset. And I said, finally somebody portrays a double star. If you look out in the night sky, more than half the stars there that you see are double or multiple star systems. And they were never really portrayed. Wow. Uh, not in any sort of casual, interesting way, which they did for that film. Not only that, the stars are orbiting close enough to each other that the orbit of that planet is not confused. And it sees the two of them just as one and orbits that one pole. They have, if the orbits are much more separated, then the gravitational allegiance gets continually questioned of that planet trying to orbit the stars. And typically the orbit goes unstable and it's not, it, it, it's not retained. So they did that right. And it is the only science they did right in Star Wars. Everything else is just fantasy. And I'm not criticizing it. I'm just letting it be fantasy. Yeah. But I will compliment them for showing the double sunset okay great uh my my son gavin his uh science teacher wanted me to ask you her name is uh miss schultzka uh what part of space do you think is the most important for us to be studying and monitoring now all of it i, I don't prioritize science if there's an unknown go there no matter what the field is 
because you never know how and why and uh, how or how quickly that new knowledge obtained scientifically becomes practical knowledge uh, obtained by the creative efforts of engineers and product developers. So, no, I would be concerned about debris, space debris, because that makes space exploration dangerous, needlessly dangerous. So I, I care about that. But otherwise, no. Do it all. Okay. Interesting. Okay. I will let her know when she watches this video, she'll find out. <laughs> um, so for a very long time, uh, humans have been the, let's say, smartest creature on the planet. Maybe not, not the strongest or, you know, every, every species has its advantages, right? But from an intelligence uh, and ability to think, humans are right up there. Now we have artificial intelligence coming out that they're saying could be hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands times smarter than humans. Um, when it when it comes to AI, how might it help or hurt humanity uh, in better understanding space and science? Well, we've been using AI for decades in my field. Neural nets, anything that could do the work that I don't have to do. I'm, I'm invoking it. AI, and AI does things. You train it, or train, make it train itself with certain objectives, and let it loose. AI became headlines recently because of uh, generate generative AI, uh, where it creatively uses language to communicate with you, and it can answer questions, all drawn from the internet. So I would learn that of the hundred something thousand books, 15 of my books are source material for this giant internet understanding of reality that's, that's consumed by AI. So there's a whole intellectual property issue related to that. Uh, at first, I'm flattered, right, that AI would do that. But uh, it's an issue that remains to be resolved. Uh, but... My, my point is, what was my point? <laughs> I was... Maybe just that if, if it can make things easier... Oh, yeah, yeah, make things easier. Manage. So, yeah, so uh, AI's beaten us at checkers and chess and and uh, beat us at Go, even beat us at Jeopardy, for goodness sake. The world didn't end when that happened. It was just another <laughs> intriguing advance of that of that marketplace. So now that it can write your term paper, the liberal arts folks are, you know, losing their shit and saying, oh, my gosh, AI is going to take. All well, it's, I'm saying so much of your everyday life is steeped in AI to turn around and say AI is bad is not to recognize all that is good with it and has been demonstrated as such because of it. Okay. Interesting. Um, I, I don't know. Uh if this is best left to Jules Verne or back to the future. Uh, but do you think at some point humans will be able to do time travel? Uh, certainly into the future, but backwards time travel is a little more um, fraught with unresolved paradoxes. So, right, if you go back in time, prevent your parents from meeting each other, then you're never born to go back in time and prevent your parents from meeting each other. So we're still trying to figure that one out. Uh, so uh, uh, Hawking suggested there might be what he called time travel conjecture, which is backwards time travel conjecture, which is you cannot go backwards in time uh, for those paradoxical reasons. But um, you can imagine what it's like to do so. But you can't actually do so. And so, but forward time travel, no problem. I mean, you just, just get on a spaceship, go fast. Fewer seconds will tick for you than for everyone you left on Earth. And if you come back after 10 years of your time, it's 100 years of Earth time, we would have long forgotten about you. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. Okay. That's what you want to accomplish. So, and, and is that just uh, getting closer to the speed of light, the reason that that happens? Yes. Yes, it's the rate at which it happens increases. Okay, okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Um, final, final question. I appreciate you coming on. This has been a, a great conversation and, and I, I highly recommend uh, people uh, pick up the book, but um, we, it, it seems like life has its best shot when it's near water. Um, life as we know it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. As we know it. Yeah. So how do you think all the water got here to earth or, or was generated? And then if, if we do find intelligent life out there, would you guess that it would be carbon-based life like ourselves, or something completely different? So water contains hydrogen and oxygen. These are two of the top three most abundant elements in the universe. We don't have to appeal, appeal to special causes for the source of Earth's water. Um, so the first point about that. Second, carbon is highly chemically active. So if you were going to base a, a new kind of life on one of the elements of the periodic table, carbon is your choice because it can make more kinds of molecules than any other means. So that's you need that from when you're experimenting on different life forms. All right, the tree of life got diverse very quickly from just a few variants that um, that we're presented with. And so, uh, what was the third part of that? You said uh, no. Just do do you think if we found intelligent life, it would be carbon based like ourselves, or would it? Be yes. It's, it's so that oh, plus uh, carbon is hugely abundant. So I have no reason to think that life uh, in the universe would be specifically different from life here in terms of biochemically it would certainly look very different yeah we don't look anything like oak trees or lobsters or jellyfish or worms and so uh yeah that's okay to me that's the lesson of who looks like what well by the way the notion that we'll find another intelligent species is quite ego driven because what is the next smartest species to us on Earth? I would say maybe a dolphin or a pig or an ape. Yeah, yeah, the great apes, the chimps, typically we cite that. And all right, if that's the case, uh, can, can you have a meaningful conversation with a chimp? The answer is no. Yet it comes closest to us in intelligence. So imagine an alien that has the same increment smarter than us than we have relative to the chimp our most complex thoughts would be trivial to them and their trivial thoughts would be out of our intellectual reach if the relationship between humans and chimps is any indication yeah oh that's interesting to think about huh. well this is, this has been fun neil i appreciate you oh, coming excellent on. If, okay uh, if people want to follow you learn more What's what's the best way to do that? And then I'll make sure to put a link to uh, Infinity and Beyond so people can support you and buy the book. Excellent. And my co-author on that is Lindsay Nix, okay. who's a longtime uh, senior producer for Star Talk. Star Talk okay. Radio. Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, so, uh, what was I going to do by signing out? What, what did you have? Uh, no, I just uh, what what's the best way for people to follow you? To follow? Yeah, yeah. So I'm just uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson on all social media platforms except x which where you have to count characters to fit in their answers so i'm just neil tyson on neil twitter tyson. and on x yeah okay great i'll make sure to put that down below thank you very much i appreciate you coming on and and have a great rest of your you got day. it okay thank you mm -hmm. bye, -bye. bye.